Dr. Sanders, thank you for being here with us. Uh, my, my pleasure, although I, I plan to just be in the background unless you ask me a question. I appreciate that. I'm gonna go ahead and start letting folks in. Um, I'm gonna admit Alex first and then I'm gonna let folks in. Right, give me just a second. Hey, Alex. Hey, how's it going? Good. Are you, um, I feel like I need to make you a co-host, correct? Oh, oh, sure. Yeah. Because you'll have stuff to share, right? I will. I will. Okay. So I'm going to make you, um, maybe I am not going to do that yet. Um, I'm going to let folks in um, and then I will make you the host so you can share stuff. Okay. That sounds great. Hey, give me a second here. Dr. Sanders, how's it going? Hello, hello. Hey, John, how's it going? Hi, John Gladman, we could hear you. Hey, John. Hey, Adrian. Can't hear you. Can you hear me now? No, I, I just, yeah, I, hear you now. I, just okay. unmute, I had to unmute myself. You cut your hair. Yes, I did. Do you like it? Yes. It looks great. This is where I wore my hair for over 30 years. It looks great. It looks, it looks great. just great. Thank you. Good for you. Now I know Joe is, it was Joe is coming and, um, and Tom and Lewis can't make it, uh, but the, and Bobby, Bobby's gonna join us too. So I'm that's here. the, oh, she's there. Oh, she's there. Not on okay, camera. good. Bob. Hey, Bobby. Hi, Pam. Hey, Adrian. Hi, hi, everybody. Oh, okay. Hi, it's yeah. so good to see you at last. I know. Gosh, I, don't, so big. I don't see Bobby yeah. though. She's oh. here. She doesn't have her, her, her video. Okay. Oh dear. And there's Sandy. Hi, Sandy. I take this down a little bit. Is that better? Sandy, we a little cleaned bit. up yeah. the there. Sandy, we cleaned up there the art room for you. You'll love the art room. It's all They're gorgeous. Talking about the, the um the five of us, the volunteers, cleaned it all up. So you'll love wow. it. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Can't wait to see it. Yeah, it was great. And see great. everyone. Emily, you're looking very serious. I'm mm -hmm. watching all of the names pop up and making sure I admit people into the room in a timely fashion. <laughs> I take my job very seriously, Adrian. <laughs> That's a good Can you hear me? This is Amy. Yes. Okay, no, good. Okay. So, Emily, I came by, and by the time I went to the car, you were, you were standing on the steps, all the way on the outside, and John was talking to me, and when I looked up again, you were gone. I thought I saw you pull in the parking lot, and I was like, I think that's Pam, and then I said, Yeah, I wanted you to see, I had to go to the doctor, and he asked me where my collar when I came. Oh. Because he's been dealing with these knees since 2017. And so I said, well, let me stop by here and holler at y'all. 
That's awesome. Yeah. You'll have to wear it the next time too. Uh-uh. <laughs> There's Annie, 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 Annie. Hi, Annie. Hey, Adrian. Hi, it's so good to see you. Golly, it's been a year since we've seen you. It certainly has. A full wow. year. A full year. Wow. I'm wow. ready to get back to living, aren't you? Oh, yeah, we've been living, but <laughs> except for the last four months when we couldn't go in, but we were there all the time other than that, except for since Thanksgiving. So, but we missed you. That's for darn sure, uh, Annie. Thank you. <coughs> Great. Emily, how many, how many more uh, folks are we expecting? I'm not sure. I say we wait just a couple more minutes and then I will go ahead and make you the host so you can get started. Perfect. They are just, we've just about tripled in. So we'll wait just a couple more minutes though. So Joe, I just sent him the link again. And, and um, who was the other one that, okay, we got Pam and Joe and uh, Bobby, of course. Who am I missing? Lewis, that's all. Yeah, so Joe is not on yet, but he should be. There's Bobby. Hi, Bobby. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Bobby. I was looking for you and looking for you, and I didn't see you. I said, where is that lady? <laughs> I'm here on my You're iPhone. There. You're there. I'm so glad. That's wonderful. Well, I don't know what's happening here. And why can't we see you, John Gladman? I don't think he's there. Trying to get in the house and get in front of a computer. There he is. But I keep thinking I'm hooking up my Bluetooth device. It says connected, but I can't make it work. And we have, you don't have we a have, picture either. We have to see your face. Uh, otherwise, you just can't be in this right. meeting, John. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Great. While, uh, while we're getting uh, John's video going, I think we're going to go ahead and start. Um, my name is Alex Soltani. I am a first year uh, medical school student. At, oh, before we start too, if everyone could just uh, mute their microphones, that would be great just to make uh, things easier and make sure everyone gets to hear uh, the presentation today. Thank you all so much. I think John Gladman, if there's any way as well. Um, perfect, okay, awesome. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Alex Soltani. I'm a first year medical school student at Wake Forest School of Medicine just here in Winston-Salem. Uh, and we're joined today uh, by Dr. John Sanders. Uh, he is chief of infectious diseases uh, in the Department of Internal Medicine at Wake Forest Baptist Health. Uh, he did his uh, both his uh, medical doctorate and his MPH degree, Masters of Public Health uh, at Tulane. Uh, and he did his residency uh, with the Navy. So we're really, really uh, happy to have him uh, join me. Uh, just the way it's gonna work today, just so everyone everyone knows, we have until 6.45 or so, at least that's in, uh, as much time as uh, Dr. Sanders has, has with us. And so I'm gonna give a brief presentation around 10 minutes or so. And then Dr. Sanders, Sanders will just give uh, just a few minutes of remarks on, on the presentation. And then we're just gonna open it up to, to questions from you all. This is really meant to be just uh, you know, an opportunity for you all to, to talk more about um, any questions you have about the vaccines, about COVID-19, about how that relates to you all um, coming back into city with dwellings and you know, working at, at the center in a safe way um, with this homeless population. So with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen with you all. Oh, oh, actually, for some reason, it Emily, is there any way you could make me a host? I think actually it does say that I, um, that's a disabled, oh, awesome. Yay, perfect. Okay, and let's see, let me know if you all can see that screen. Perfect, okay, can everyone see this? Yeah. Great, okay. 
So again, thank you so much, Dr. Sanders, for, for joining us today. Um, and so, you know, I'm not going to really go into, you know, what exactly is, is COVID-19. We've been, you know, living through this pandemic now for over, over a year. So you all, you know, are, are, are aware a little bit more or less of, of what it is. Um, but, you know, just want to remind everyone that it is spread primarily via respiratory droplets. And so that's just, you know, when you're, when you're talking, when you're coughing, when you're breathing, um, you know, you in, in your within six feet of somebody that you can transmit it to that, that individual. And then also, um, you know, much more rare, but, but they, the droplets do, um, do land around, you know, you, and then you can touch that area. And then if you touch your face, that is a way that you can also contract um, COVID-19. And the, you know, the three main symptoms, uh, fever, cough, uh, and difficulty breathing. And those the symptoms, as we all know, I think by now too, uh, last between uh, two and 14 days. So the vaccine is, is just such an important thing for all of us to get right now at this stage um, because you know not only does it help you to, to uh, make sure you don't get sick but it really helps the people around you as well um, not to get sick and so you know again I just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page here so I apologize if this is information that you may have already heard uh, but just you know the lower petition you know doesn't hurt too that just wanted to make sure everyone you know really knows that the, the vaccines that we have on the market right now for COVID-19, they don't include the virus. This is just parts of the virus. Um, uh, this, is, this is part of the virus that we're coding for so that your, your body makes part of it and then it realizes that that's a foreign invader and then it kills it. So then when the big actual virus does come into contact with your body, then your body can neutralize that. So again, there is no full virus by any means in this vaccine. And this is the analogy here with, you know, different parts of the car don't make, don't make up a car as well. Um, let's see. Great. And, you know, another big question that I wanted to just make sure everyone, everyone is aware of too, as we're continuing is, you know, there's been a lot of discussion and conversation about, you know, wow, this is so fast. You know, this is, this is just this is unprecedented, frankly, you know, how we've been able to come up with a vaccine so quickly. And yeah, it's, it's been very fast, but I think actually I was talking to um, uh, one of my, my mentors earlier about this and she said it really well, Dr. Matthews. It's kind of like, you know, you're building a house and if you have, you know, five people, you know, and, you know, a few supplies, maybe that'll take 10 years or so to build that house. But, you know, if you have hundreds of thousands of workers and you have all the resources at your disposal, that that house is going to get built really quickly. And, you know, also I just want to make sure everyone's aware too, that the, the food and drug administration, which, you know, make sure they give the, the okay for these vaccines too. There is a very robust um, way that, you know, phasing that uh, these vaccines have to go through to make sure that not only are they safe, but they're effective. And, you know, none of these phases were cut short at all. You know, they have to make sure that they meet certain criteria before they move on to the next phase. And so it was very fast, you know, but that had to happen for us to get, you know, slowly more back to the normalcy and as fast as we could. And, you know, any questions on that too, you know, myself or Dr. Sanders can, can discuss that. So I mentioned a little bit about how that works. Um, and, you know, for, for the, the Moderna and the Pfizer, we need two doses. Um, as you can see on the, on the graph in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, if you have get one dose of the Moderna or the Pfizer, that only really, uh, you know, uh, keeps you 50% protected. Uh, and, and they are safe, as I mentioned before, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, safety measures that went into that too. This is something that's been tested in tens of thousands of people before um, it, it went on to market and before it got that, that clearance. And you can see um, here, the Moderna was 30,000 people and the Pfizer was uh, 40, 43,000 people. Um, we are seeing that people in the second dose of the Pfizer Moderna are having a little more side effects and those side effects are listed just below in the bottom right-hand corner. And so those are going to be, you know, just soreness where you get the vaccine, you may be a little tired, um, you may have a little bit of a headache uh, and body aches as well, but those do go away uh, around 24 hours after. Of course, everyone's different. And, you know, what are the benefits? I mentioned before, you know, it's not only making yourself safe, but also it's making, keeping those around you safe. But, you know, most importantly, um, 
with all the three vaccines in the market, you know, you you will not go to the hospital with severe infection for COVID-19 and, you know, they'd prevent death from COVID-19. And that is so important right now. Um, and of course, you know, we've talked about too, the Pfizer and Moderna, those are 95% effective even for mild um, cases as well. So the Johnson Johnson too, I, uh, you know, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Sanders too, when we get there too, or has, has around 80% um, of mild, uh, of mild uh, protection as well. So the wonderful, wonderful uh, options we have on the market today. Uh, and there are some things that we don't know. I wanna make sure that we talk about that. You know, we don't know yet fully how long the vaccine effects are going to last. So we're gonna have to, you know, come back and get another one in six months, a year, five years, you know, we're, we're unsure um, because we, you know, because of the way that, that these trials are ongoing at, at, at this time. Um, and we don't know yet exactly the more, more studies are being done right now, you know, if children are affected or, you know, are protected are pregnant women protected as well. We actually did get a, uh, I got a, a notification on my phone today, actually, that, that shared that the Pfizer vaccine is hundred percent effective for, for children, uh, 12 and up. So, you know, just as we continue on, there's going to be more and more information, um, and, you know, the, this right now, the, the data is really strong. Um, that you know we can't transmit the, um, the 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 virus, but we're not fully sure yet, and that's why it's just so important that even the people that are vaccinated, you know, continue to wear a mask so we make sure that we don't transmit um, the, the the virus. And this is uh, this is a, a graph that uh, one of the physicians at Wake Forest uh, he sends around, Dr. Anthony Blyer. Um, just want to give everyone. Uh, just th this this image, I think it's, it's really good. He just sends, uh, you know, how uh, the county is going uh, and how uh, Wake Forest Baptist, uh, the health system is looking to in terms of uh, COVID-19 infection. So the red uh, line is all infections in the county. And the, uh, the blue line is uh, Wake Forest Baptist health system hospitalizations. And so you're seeing just you know, wonderfully so, dramatic decreases in all COVID-19 cases in Forsyth, Forsyth County, which is wonderful. You know, it kind of stagnated here recently. So, you know, we're not really kind of continuing on the downward trend we had been going um, for a while. That's kind of, that's that, that just, we need to continue to vaccinate as many people as we can. Um, something that is just a little bit concerning is that, you know, now we're having just a small, uh, a, a, a higher ratio of the people that do get COVID-19 at right now uh, seem to be having a little bit uh, more severe cases and are requiring hospitalization. So, you know, fewer mild cases um, to severe case ratio. So that, that's kind of a little bit concerning. Here we can just see uh, since Thanksgiving, just the, the different counties uh, in the area, Guilford, Forsyth, Davidson, and Wilkes. Guilford here, the most uh, in, in blue, followed by Forsyth, and then Davidson and, and Wilkes counties. But again, you know, we're really happy that that line is, you know, is trending more flat and that's really important and it's helpful, good to see. And then I also wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, people that are most at risk for contracting COVID-19. Um, communities of color are, uh, you know, much more likely disproportionately affected. Um, and, and that's just really important to know. And it's extremely important to know, or you can see here, actually, there's more information uh, by race in North Carolina, uh, specifically, uh, you have, uh, you know, on on the left side, just cases in general in the Hispanic Latino community, um, followed by the American Indian community, and then um, the Black community, just much more affected uh, per 100,000 people than the white community, the Asian community. So it's just important to know, especially because we're talking about city with dwellings today. We're talking about, you know, working with the homeless population. And so here's a graph that just shows um, that the homeless population is, you know, much more so than just the average population in this country, um, Black Americans, and they are disproportionately affected by, by COVID-19, um, much more disproportionately so Hispanic Americans. And so that's just very important to know that this is some, this is a, a, a community that we're working with that, you know, really is affected, not only because of the, their demographic makeup, but then also because of sort of just the way that the homeless population interacts with, with each other and, and with, with folks, you know, they're much more uh, 
in close contact with each other. They're much more in a gathering space. Um, and that's just, you know, another way that we, that we spread this, this disease. So just the things that are important to know. And I also wanted to talk about, you know, maybe want to share some data about uh, the homeless population Hey, Alex, and how they're before, contracting. You, yes. before you do that, I know there's some folks trying to get in that I can't let in oh, while yeah. you're doing that. Can you let them in really quickly? Yes, I I'm think sorry. I just did. Um, no, 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 please. Um, and yeah, also if, you know, th thank you for saving, you know, questions till the end too, but if anyone has any, any pressing questions too, happy to, to answer them at this time, uh, we can also just wait uh, a little, a little bit longer as well. Um, and so again, like I was saying before too, we just don't actually have really strong data on um, COVID-19 and as it relates to the homeless population. So the, the housing and urban development is generally uh, the body uh, in the government that, that is in charge of uh, tracking uh, health data of the homeless population in this country. And they didn't require, um, the, the federal government when the pandemic began did not require housing and urban development to track COVID-19 infection specifically among this population. And so as a result, we just don't have that strong of data at all. Um, and it's a big problem. And you know, there's been journal articles writing about the fact that this is a huge space for health and equity right now and a, a place that's really been under, under discussed. Um, also, you know, uh, you know, stat news in the middle there and then USA Today is talking about, you know, the crisis within a crisis. This is something that I think really hasn't been getting as much attention. It's just something that we really need to be, be really thinking of. Um, but, you know, so New York City, for example, we're seeing, you know, that was a hotbed too. Um, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic for, for the COVID-19, um, they have 67% higher mortality rates for, for the homeless population than, uh, than just the general population in New York City. So, you know, with, we have very limited data, uh, but it's just really astounding how, how, how much of a crisis it is for the homeless population. And so we just we need to be very, very vigilant um, as, as we work with this, as we come back to working with, with this population. And again, I mentioned before, there's still a lot we don't know. And now these variants are kind of also adding a wrench into some things that we, that we don't know. You know, the United Kingdom one, the South Africa one, the Brazil one too. Uh, we're, we're doing tests right now to see, you know, these vaccines to make sure that they, they are very strongly protective against these variants. Um, but we, we just have to kind of wait and see. And so this is, this is the hard part now is that, and, you know, we'll, we'll be opening us up to discussion with Dr. Sanders more too, but, you know, we need to make sure that we're really putting strong measures in place for you all too, so that, you know, we don't infect the homeless population with COVID-19 as we're volunteering, but then also that we stay safe too. Um, and so with that, um, I'll, I'll allow Dr. S Dr. Sanders just to, to make uh, any more few remarks, maybe to clarify things maybe that I, um, that I had said, um, and then we'll open it up to questions from you all. Alex, I thought you did a great job. I don't have anything to clarify, but I'm happy to, to help answer any questions that might come up. Dr. Sanders, John Glavin here. What is the, or your feeling as they are continually talking about the third, fourth wave, I guess it is, as well as the mutations of the virus and you know speaking from a person who has been vaccinated is there any what is the true level of fear of this mutation possibly being able to impact me even though i've had one of the first versions of the uh vaccination uh, Mr. Gladman, I am so glad you've been vaccinated. Way to go. I'm uh, glad, glad to hear that. Um, <clears throat> I mean, first, I think we should, we should clarify, and Alex, jump in if I'm not, if I'm not right about this, okay? But let's, let's clarify when we talk about variants, we talk, Mr. Gladman, you use the term mutation. I think that's a really good term to use as well. Every time a virus or anything else reproduces, its offspring, its babies, are a little bit different. So every, you know, uh, every time somebody gets infected with COVID-19 and the virus replicates in their body and then spreads to somebody else, some of those viruses are going to be a, a little different. They're going to have variation or be a variant. A few of those variants have been different enough and have become common enough that we're really paying a lot of attention to them. Um, so far, 
While there are a couple of worrisome ones, that South African strain is, is worrisome because um, uh, while the vaccine still is protective against it, it's not as protective uh, as it is against the, the regular strain. The Brazilian strain is very worrisome, although a lot more data needs to, to be collected about that. Um, but as it stands right now, the strains that are circulating commonly in the United States are all being well protected by the vaccine. We're, we're protected against all of them very well by the vaccine. And the faster we get everybody vaccinated, the fewer viruses will replicate and the fewer chances of more variants uh, coming out uh, there will be. So how worried should you be? How worried should I be? I don't think we should be that worried at all. Now, I, I do think that the public health departments CDC, the state, the counties ought to be doing ought to be doing surveillance where they're collecting a certain number of these virus, viruses and tracking so that they give us a good early warning signal so that the vaccine companies know what they need to do to adjust the vaccines and good for us they are doing exactly that. Uh, they have the systems in place to be collecting these viruses, looking for these strains these strain variants, and then adjusting to them. And when I say adjusting to them, uh, one of the great advantages of this mRNA vaccine technology, and even of the technology that Johnson & Johnson is using, is that they can modify that very quickly. Um, so if a strain emerges that we really think, oh, we need a new, a modified vaccine, the great news is Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson ought to be able to add to their repertoire very, very quickly. I will, I will pause for any questions, clarification. Alex, you jump in and, and add to that if I missed it. No, that, that, was, that was very well said. I think I just want to emphasize again that what Dr. Sanders said that, you know, we, we are just, there is no data that shows that, that we're not safe right now after getting the vaccine. And that's why it's so important to get the vaccine. Um, we're just kind of monitoring those, those mutations, those variants, but, but everything so far points to the fact that we are protected from these variants. So there's been a lot, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the variants in the news. That's why I wanted to bring it up, you know, because I, I know that's something that's concerning on everyone's minds, um, but, but we have good data right now um, and there's no data to suggest that you are not protected from that. And Mr. Gladman, I'm going to be a little controversial. I hope you'll forgive me for this uh, and say that while I really, really respect Dr. Fauci and Dr. Walensky, the new director of the CDC, and I take them, you know, I, I take them very seriously when they are cautioning us to, to continue to be careful, and we should. I think we are we are ahead of those variants right now. If we keep rolling out the vaccine as fast as we're rolling it out now, we are ahead of those dangers. I have a question about the homeless that we work with. Um, have they been having the opportunity to be vaccinated and are they accepting of it? Sandy, we, so, one of the things we have done, and we, we created a great partnership with one of the pharmacies and they've allowed us to take, bring people on certain days and times to get vaccinated. Up to this point, we've gotten about 25 people, uh, but, but there, there has been some resistance, you know, not a lot, you know, it's, it's coming from a lot of different spaces, uh, especially from our minority clients, of course, with, with the history of uh, the testing, but we, you know, we just remain vigilant and continue to offer it to them when the opportunity has occurred. Now, I, I will say in the community that we serve, or we know our people is kind of as we call them, there's been a very low number of people that we have seen, you know, you know, as they come in, they say, oh, Sally has COVID. 
that's not, uh, we haven't seen much of that. I think the system itself has done a really good job with uh, putting them in safe places, quarantining and those types of things. But there has been a little resistance, but we're, we're doing all we can from our seat to get them vaccinated as quickly as possible. And they've been taking the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you that, that um, um, there's conversations about studies, about studies about, um, those, those I'm sorry, do y'all hear, hear, hear an echo? echo? Oh gosh. Emily, there's gosh. an echo. Emily, there's an echo. All right. All right. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but they are. Um, but they are. They're looking at setting up. They're looking at setting up back at city with dwellings. City with dwellings. And then also, and the then also the continuum, of continuum of care is working to do some is working to do some about education around about education around for our communities for our communities specifically. There is a question in the chat I received. If someone has already tested positive, um, could their blood be tested before having to take the vaccine? Um, let's see. I So Dr. Sanders, you, you, you can hop in too. Uh, I, in terms of the, the, the blood being tested, um, I'm, I'm unsure about, about that. I, to my knowledge, that's not anything that, need, that needs to happen. But I will say that something that's very important uh, is there have been folks that, that I know and there's been shared in, you know, in, 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 uh, in the literature too, that if you get COVID, if you're positive for, for COVID and then you get the vaccine very soon after, then you're going to have a, a very bad reaction potentially when you get the vaccine. So it's good, you know, if you do have COVID, maybe to space it out, uh, even a few months, but I, I want Dr. Sanders to hop in and, and clarify that if, if, if he's heard the same thing, if that's, if that's correct. Uh, well, I, I would say first, uh, is there a blood test? Well, you can, you can check for antibodies. Um, the typical antibody tests that are, are done out of most labs um, are not they have not been well tested to, you know, to tell you, oh, I've got an antibody, therefore I'm immune. Uh, it, it's not, it's not that one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. But if somebody has antibodies, it does tend to correlate with immunity, uh, meaning it, it suggests it very, very strongly, but it's not actually the protective element. Um, so could you do a blood test? You could. Um, and if it is positive, it would give some comfort that there is immunity, but it's not a guarantee. Importantly, if somebody really had COVID and their antibody test is negative, that does not mean that they're not protected uh, against a future infection because we know that the antibody levels will drop below the level of detection for most of these tests, but that does not mean their immune system has turned off. It doesn't mean that they won't respond and protect them against a future, uh, a future infection. What we, what we know, whether or not you have a blood test, is that somebody who has COVID has generally has good protective immunity for at least 90 days after they've had, after they've had COVID. So if somebody's been infected, they are likely protected for at least three months and probably a good bit longer. But we don't know how much longer. And therefore, if somebody's had COVID and they ask about the vaccine, we generally recommend a couple of things. One, you don't have to rush to get it. If you just got over COVID, you've probably got a 90 day window uh, to safely wait and get in line when it's a little bit more convenient. Two, uh, it won't hurt you. So here I'm gonna disagree with Alex a little bit. It doesn't, uh, there, there's not good evidence that it, that it hurts you to get the vaccine sooner uh, than 90 days. You just don't have to get it. We do try to tell people to wait until they've really gotten over the infection before they get vaccinated. But that's, that's kind of standard advice for any vaccine. We ask, you know, we just generally recommend 
that if you're if you're sick, wait until you're not sick when you get the next vaccine. Partly it's so that that the reaction to the vaccine is not confused with your ongoing illness. And partly we see that people tend to have a, a better response to a vaccine if that's what they're focused on, rather than fighting two things at once. I have a question. Um, and I, I realize that it's gonna be a while before we'll find out how long this initial vaccine will take before, you know, how long it will protect us. What is your estimation of when we'll find out how long these vaccines will last? In other words, will we have to take it every year? How long will you find out before, you know, cause I know this is new, so. Alex, I'm happy for you to answer that one if you know, but I will, I will, I will gladly jump in and just confess ignorance. We don't know yet. The, the, the people who are in the clinical trials, the Pfizer trial, the Moderna trial, the Johnson & Johnson trial, the vast majority of those volunteers have agreed to stay in those studies and are still coming in regularly and, and being tested are still reporting their symptoms. Uh, when they're coming in and, and giving blood, their antibody levels and their other immune markers are all being tested. But most importantly, I had a, a volunteer in the Moderna trial the, the other day ask me, you know, uh, when, when will we know whether I need a booster? And I had to explain to him that, well, we will know when we need a booster after you get you're the person who volunteered to uh, help us figure this out. And so we are watching those volunteers very closely to help try to, to, to answer exactly those questions. In addition to that, there are a lot of other studies, some that we're doing at Wake Forest and, and lots that are being done around the world that are just, we call them real world studies. Uh, and people are volunteering about their symptoms, having antibodies checked, uh, uh, volunteering to let people look in their electronic health record so that we can track exactly those questions, not just in that research study, but in, in kind of a real world analysis to, to get even more data. My personal, personal guess, these have worked so well, I don't think we're gonna need them every year. I, I think they're gonna last a while, maybe a very good while. Yeah, no, that, that was a great, great answer, for, uh, Dr. Sanders. And the only thing I'd add too is that, um, you know, like like he mentioned, we're 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 checking these these folks, you know, all the time. We're keeping a close eye on them, and there's nothing that we're seeing right now that says, oh, like you know, they're, the the person in the trial isn't isn't uh, isn't covered by by COVID nineteen anymore. You know, right now it's it's so far so good, and you know, there haven't been any any issues. Uh, so. So yeah, again, you know, when will we know? I, I, I'm not sure, but but we are, you know, we're still kind of we're still kind of good, and 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 we're, I guess we'll we'll be approaching. The the Pfizer and Moderna Moderna studies I think began, in the fall of of last year. Is that right? Right, right. Uh, early, late summer, early fall, we started to vaccinate people. So we're even a, you know, we're I guess maybe. Eight, eight months or so, um, you know, into into it, and so far, um, so good. So we'll just well, we're gonna, we're gonna... and 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 Alex, I, I haven't thought of this answer as as well before as I should have. Uh, I will say, you know, people talk, oh, these are new new technologies, new vaccines, and they are new. I mean, it, it's groundbreaking uh, new technology that's going to dramatically change how we vaccinate and uh, and what things to vaccinate against. But the technology, we've been working on it for decades. The mRNA vaccine itself it has taken us decades to get to this point. And just about 18 months ago, two years ago, a year before, you know, less than a year before COVID emerged, the, the, the keynote speaker for our medical student research day at, uh, at Wake Forest was the head of the NIH vaccine program. And the, the theme that he was talking about, the, the theme of his, of his speech to the medical students 
were mRNA vaccines and how he felt very confident that NIH had figured it out and that if and when a new virus emerged, and he frankly was betting on influenza, uh, but he mentioned coronaviruses in his talk, uh, but he said, if, if one emerges, we think that we have a technology that will allow us to respond very quickly and very effectively. And sure enough, he was, uh, he was completely right. Um, and I'm super grateful for that. I bring that up because they had been working on this technology for years and testing it for things like influenza and Ebola and other viruses. And in those much smaller studies, uh, those volunteers not only have been safe for years, but they still have very good protective immunity against influenza and, and some of the other viruses that they had made the vaccine against four, five, six years later. So I'm hopeful that that will be true for SARS-CoV-2, for COVID as well. I have a question. May I have a, ask a que some questions, please? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, my name is Adrian, and I've been volunteering at City with Drillings for five years. Um, four, five of us were volunteering all through the entire time up until this past Thanksgiving, when it was deemed that it was better if the volunteers no longer came uh, for various reasons, because of Thanksgiving and people getting together and Christmases and what have you. So far, we're still not back, which is kind of disappointing to the five that have really been the kind of core volunteers all this time. Um, but I wanted to say that, ask three questions. Um, first of all, it's an e it's, I think it's a straightforward question. How long do the germs from COVID remain uh, on a table or a surface? that what you had mentioned, Alex, that you can put your hand on it and then put your face and da da da. I'm just, I never have known. I mean, we have Joey who goes around spraying like mad every time somebody gets up the, from the table, but that was one question. Two, um, it's just a, uh, I'm wondering also, you had said that we keep wearing masks even though we've been vaccinated and by the by, um, I'm in my seventies and every single friend that we have has been vaccinated just for you all to know. Uh, I've been vaccinated well with the Pfizer twice. So I just thought you would like to know that. And we have quite a number of friends in, in our age group. Um, but anyway, uh, with the, even though you've been vaccinated, uh, I'm questioning how long uh, after in your, in your judgment, if you can possibly foresee how long we'll be needing to wear the masks. Um, a gentleman that was gave a wonderful, wonderful hour long uh, talk for our church, the Moravian church. Um, had, he was of German descent and he was at Wake Forest and that man had every chart, every, he was phenomenal. I couldn't possibly remember everything he was telling us. But um, he was projecting the end of July. But again, that I'm just questioning you, you both you and Alex and the doctor. And then my third question is, um, well, just as a sort of a statement, when we were still working, uh, volunteering at City with Rollings up until November, um, we I did not know one. Well, there was one lady who said she had COVID, but, but we John and I were not really sure if that was the case or not. Um, but I am still in very big uh, close contact with three other very low income housing uh, developments here in Winston-Salem. Not one, not one that I know of has, has there been a um, COVID outbreak in one, on all three of those apartments. And I thought that was very interesting as well. And maybe you could comment on that. I said, because Alex, you had said that the, the black population is so much more susceptible and the, these apartments are very, not all black, but they're very, they have a lot of black people there and no one's getting it. And they're not wearing masks, which is just, I don't understand it. It's, so I, that's another question I'd like if you, I know that's a lot of questions and of course you don't have to answer them all, but 
I just thought I'd throw them out there. So thank you. No, no, no. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'll, I'll kind of try my best at, at the, the three and then I'll let Dr. Sanders hop in right after. So in terms of the, the respiratory droplets, I think in the very beginning of the pandemic, we were, we were really concerned. We, you know, we really didn't have that much data on, on that. And we, uh, and we were like, oh gosh, you know, we didn't know how fully it was spreading. And so, you know, that was something that we were really worried about. Um, you know, now we're a little less worried about it because we know that primarily it's spread by, by, again, by talking, by being in close contact with somebody um, via the, the droplets that, that come spewing out of my mouth. You know, thank God you're not here in the same room with me. No, I'm, I'm vaccinated too, but, but, um, but so that's why. So then I guess we also know now that the, the droplets themselves, they kind of sit on these surfaces and they die. You know, the, the virus can't live on these surfaces for forever. You know, it, it dies after a few hours. Again, Dr. Sanders, correct me if I'm wrong you know, in a second, but, but, what we are worried about is then, you know, right after someone's talking, you know, you touch the table that, that the droplet fell and then you're touching your face, you're touching your face and then it's going into your mouth, into your nose, into your eyeball. So that's, that's the problem. Again, if, if you're vaccinated, we're good, you know, but, but that's the worry is that, you know, we, and this is actually going into the second, the second, the second point is that when you're coming back into volunteer at city with dwellings, we don't know if the, if the, the folks that you're working with are vaccinated and, and they're most likely at, at this point, not, and it's going to take, you know, it's a process to, to get, to get them to, to, you know, get the knowledge that they need and to, you know, to help them get to that point that they, they, they'd like to take the vaccine. And so that's the problem is that then if, you know, because we don't, we don't, we don't really know who's talking and where the droplets are going and then who's touching their mouth and who, you know, that, that kind of thing. So that's why we're, we're all wearing the mask um, in there. If you want to have a you know, dinner party with everyone who's fully vaccinated, everyone in your house is fully vaccinated, no masks, you're good to go. That's not a problem at all. But when you're dealing with people, you don't know for, for certain if they've had the vaccine, that's why we're wearing the mask just to make sure that, and it's not just you, it's everyone's wearing the mask just again to, to make sure that we don't, uh, continue to, to spread. And then your third point, I, I would say that is just wonderful that, the, that, that those, that the folks that are living in, in those buildings haven't gotten it. Again, this is just data that we have across the country, you know, everywhere. Um, and I, 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 I'll speak to the, the Hispanic population, for example, too. Um, I know that, you know, something that's very important within their culture is just, is community and family. And they just, there's a lot more um, folks that live Live together. Families just live together more. And so just because of the fact that there are just more people in, in, in the home, that's, that's the thing, you know, people are coming from different places and then coming back and then sharing and bringing potentially the, 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 uh, the, the virus with them. And so, you know, that's just one specific example of one specific community, but, but, you know, it, it's just more that we know this data. And so we just need to be, we need to be extra, extra vigilant. And the way that we can do that is to get the vaccine and then to continue wearing the mask. So hopefully that, that helped uh, answer that and then I'll let Dr. Sanders hop in now as well. Uh, Alex, can I jump in here? Hold on, Jeff. Absolutely. So, you know, it is proven because of the lack of health equity in lower income slash minority communities, the potential of the spread or obtaining the COVID virus is higher. And, you know, I think Amy, Someone asked, do we know about any many income-based uh, housing carrying the virus? No, we do not. I don't think the health department actually has that data. Uh, I know there's been strong efforts to set up vaccination sites closer to some of our lower income or income-based housing uh, areas, but just you know, from the nature of the jobs that, that people that are living in the margins or, or not quite making um, a minimum wage or only living or not quite making a living wage, should I say, you know, they have to go to work. They have to be out. Their options are limited. They can't stay home. So I think just by the way that piece of our society is designed, it's always going to be a target. It's always going to be a target for vaccinations. And it's always going to be an assumption that these folks have something 
that others do not. But, you know, it's kind of like life. And of course, as you know, it's seated with dwellings. Bring, bring you as you are, all carrots. So it is, uh, it's, it, it's a thing. You know, I think it, that, that assumption is out there, but just kind of with this, this thing, it's just ask and continue to be positive. I know for some of the people that I've encountered that, that live in those environments or work and so, you know, I constantly, one of the best things that we can do as volunteers or, or people that are community involved, you know, ask people have they had the virus, give them a suggestion of a place to go. Ask people, uh, have they been vaccinated? Give them suggestions for places to go. Uh, that's kind of all we can do. If anyone wants to add on to that last part uh, of Adrian's of questions, Adrian's questions, feel free. Go ahead, Mimi. No, go, ahead, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Pam. Go ahead, Pam. One of, the, one of the things that you that said, said, Adrian, was about um, concerning um, people of color. And I'm trying to track this down right now. But a young lady um, who happens to be the mother of five children went to her doctor. And her doctor actually, and she's, she's a woman of color, actually advised her not to take the vaccine. And I'm trying to track down now exactly what doctor that was that told her that. But she said that she had other friends of hers who have gone to doctors in the area that have encouraged her not to take the vaccine. And that's concerning to me because, you know, people of color already are skeptical about this. And then if you have physicians out here in, uh, instructing their uh, own personal feelings about the vaccine onto their clients, that's, um, very counterproductive to what we're trying to do. So I am trying to track that particular doctor down and find out exactly what the doctor's name is and where that doctor is. Because I think that um, what I wanted to do, what I did want to ask you though, what are y'all doing to educate the doctors about this? Because if you got doctors out here telling people not to take it, they need to be educated. Because I just had my two shots. I, I had no problem with getting mine. Well, Ms. Haynes, I am so glad you got your shots, and thank you for thank you for uh, being such a strong advocate about that. Um, we we are uh, we have actually I have not personally encountered any doctors who are recommending it against it at Wake Forest or Novant, uh, but we are putting out all the information that we can uh, to the healthcare uh, community, the healthcare work. Uh, about the safety and efficacy of these vaccines and that the need for us to vaccinate as many people as quickly as we can to prevent the emergence of variant strains, but more importantly, so that we can get to those magic herd immunity type numbers where there just won't be enough of us to, uh, to efficiently pass the virus around and that will provide protection to even those of us who, because of having medical conditions, immunocompromising conditions that cause us not to respond to the vaccine well, would still be protected because the rest of us are protected and not spreading the virus. We are, we are passing as much as we can, but yes, if you identify people who are countering us, you let me know because I would love to, would love to talk to them, would, would be happy to try to convince them otherwise. I just, I just want to echo uh, Dr. Sanders' point that you know it, it's just so wonderful that you're that you're, you're such a strong advocate, and that's um, the that just the, that's what we can do. I would just say is that you know we can we can make sure that we we gather information and, and we we tell people that we that we know our family, our friends, those close to us, point them in the right direction, and and make sure that they have the the information that they need to make the most informed decision. Um, and, and that's, that's all you can ask. And that's what you're doing. And, and, and that's well, right. Pam, I have a question. Did you ask this lady 
why, for what reason her doctor said not to take it? I mean, she might have an underlying condition. Uh, no, what she's, a, she's, she's a healthy 45 year old woman with five children. She, she has no uh, pre existing conditions. She says she questioned her doctor about the vaccine and which one he thought she should take. And he told her that if I was you, I wouldn't take any of them. And he was a Caucasian doctor telling a black woman this. And that's what really upset me and he's not with Novant as far as I know. He's a private physician that she goes, she goes to his office. So I don't know whether he's affiliated with Novant or Baptist or what. That's why I'm trying to find out from her exactly who he is. Right, but so, but did you ask her why the doctor said that she should not have this vaccine? There's gotta be a reason why he said that. No, he just told her that if he was, if he was her, he wouldn't take the vaccine. All right, well. And she I said that was the end of the conversation about the vaccine. And well, I yeah. immediately instructed her to go get the vaccine. Yeah, and again, that, that's, that's, that's disappointing to hear, but that's, the, that's what you have to do in that situation. And you, you, you're handling it wonderfully. And, and, and that's, that's, that's all we can do is, you know, just, and, and even again, like what, you know, to the, that, that's why you all are so important is then, you know, now when you're coming also back into volunteer at City with Dwellings that, you know, this was even kind of in, in a way giving you all information and to make sure that, you know, you're able to, to share what you know with the homeless population to make sure why it's so important to, to give, to, to get the vaccine. So, so, you know, continue to stay informed, continue to go on to the public health, uh, the county website, you know, and making sure that you, you move people over to there to schedule their, their vaccination appointments. Um, as well, I think there's a there's a hotline for for Wake Forest Where's doctors the game health, on? potentially, Dr. Sanders. I don't know if uh, I, I can maybe find that too and share it with the city with dwellings folks, so that um, you know everyone has that information at hand, so that when folks that you're working with you know are interested in, and, and want to sign up, that you can give them that information. So that, that's what that's so important. And I just want to uh, be mindful too of Dr. Sanders' time. I, we have time for one more question. So uh, if if anyone has a question, we'd love to go ahead and answer. Well, I, my question, unless I'm someone else, does someone else have a question? My question is then, therefore, listening to you fine gentlemen, what is your opinion of the safety of the volunteers if we're needed? Because apparently, we haven't been there in four months, but apparently there have been so few people coming in to the community for a center of city with dwellings that there was nothing for us to do. This is what we were told by John Gladman and various others. Um, so, you know, if there's nothing for us to do, it's, <laughs> we, we shouldn't be in there. But um, if, there, if, if people are coming in more frequently, and I don't know if they are or not, I haven't been there, would you, would you think it's safe for the volunteers now to, because we've been doing it up until November. So I, um, yeah. So would it be safe for everybody to come back who would like to? I'm not hearing an answer. Well, uh, I, I will say that uh, there are, there are safety decisions and then there are policy decisions. And so I don't want to uh, I don't want to give an answer that is that gets confused with giving a policy decision. I think that the you know the the, the institutions themselves have to to figure out e exactly what risk they are willing to take. Every day, it is getting a bit safer. The more people who get vaccinated, the more people who have had the infection already and have some degree of protective immunity, the safer it gets for all of us. And I think we are, we are getting, we are very close uh, to that level of protection, population protection. Now, as an individual, what we know is if you've been vaccinated, with Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson, that right now, all three of those 
have a shockingly great 100% protective efficacy of people dying from COVID. Now, that's probably not going to stay 100% uh, because eventually we're going to hear about somebody in their 80s, somebody with underlying cancer, somebody who is taking a, a drug to, to suppress their immune system, who doesn't respond as well to the vaccine and gets COVID and has a severe case, even, even though they were vaccinated. So eventually those numbers are going to drop. But, but, but in general, we know now that these are incredibly protective vaccines. Uh, so you as an individual, if you've been vaccinated, you are probably, very, very probably, safe from a severe case, one that might result in hospitalization or death. However, are you as protected against maybe getting infected and having a mild or a moderate case, or maybe getting infected and spreading it to somebody else who has not been vaccinated? That we don't know yet, which is why we ask that if you are interacting with people, you still wear a mask uh, to try to decrease those risks. Now, it was probably Dr. Bischoff who spoke in your church, and, um, and I never, uh, never counter Dr. Bischoff in his graphs, uh, but, you know, if, if he said the end of July, that, that's probably reasonable. I'm thinking it's more like the middle to the end of June. I, I'm, I'm feeling more optimistic than he is about when we hit that herd immunity, when we hit that protective level, and we can start feeling like we can safely take off masks and interact. I, I, I really think that um, er, early summertime, we're going to start feeling that way. Adrian, I'll speak um, just briefly to about the coming back into city with dwellings. I mean, this is absolutely one of the first steps in doing that, right? And having this conversation about safety and the vaccine. Um, and then from here, we're, we're in conversation and planning, how do we roll out a comprehensive training of our volunteers with some different parameters that need to be set around safety for our guests and volunteers that will look like some training videos that folks will will watch and then also some on-site training um, with you know with city with dwelling staff about that so that has been the top priority within all of our conversations at staff meetings uh, for the last three weeks um, with an end goal of having these materials back in place within the next two to three weeks to get people back in here. So this, this night and this presentation and conversation was really that first step in creating uh, movement towards getting people back in here regularly. But we, we won't do it in just a really loose way because we do want to monitor and be able to see, okay, who do we know is coming to volunteer? So if there is reason to to track, we know who's in the space and we've done, we've done the due diligence on our end to make sure that, that we've set up the parameters for everyone to be successful. But it is absolutely the top priority uh, and top conversation in all of our meetings and has been for weeks. So it's, it's absolutely in motion. Emily, can I follow on to that just a bit? Yeah, absolutely. And to just say, we are, we are very, very focused right now on one virus, SARS-CoV-2, the cause of COVID, and we are tracking that. But as, as we are re-entering things like volunteering uh, with City with Dwellings and other activities, we should keep in mind, we've now gone a year without getting many cases of influenza, without getting many colds and flus that we are, are typical that we usually get to boost our immune system uh, to respond to it. Many experts, and I put my, I'm not an expert, but I put myself in this suspicion camp, are a little worried that it's going to be a hard cold and flu season next year. And I say that just to say we should not, we should not get to a point policy-wise in in activities like city with dwellings, where we suddenly say, oh, COVID is gone, 
we can just drop our guard. Instead, I think that it will be really beneficial for uh, our patrons of these services, as well as our volunteers to make sure that we're taking some more caution than we had before COVID in terms of things like trying to appropriately space and working on uh, uh, good hand washing and good hygiene all the time, because I'm afraid we're gonna see a lot of colds and flus over the next year or two. Thanks, thanks Emily. Great, and, and um, I can turn it over also to, to Emily Alex. and John. Yes, John. So just to drill down a little bit, you know, Adrian, we, you know, one of my goals since I've since I started here, we we have to make somewhat of a paradigm shift the way that we we treat each other, we treat our volunteers, and as well as we serve the community. So, as as Emily stated, you know, I'm gonna I want to Im implant some things that may be radical, but is normally standard, you know. You have to watch the videos, you have to sign in, you have to sign up. You know, Adrian, if you remember some of the things we were doing when I first came, you know, the sign in, sign out, the counting the hours, the and, and that goes all the way down to how we how we assign tasks or jobs, as we like to say, with the volunteers. You know, I, I've seen many positive things come out of COVID and, and how we how we serve our population and how the population, the resiliency of the population, as well as, as the volunteers. There is a lot of loneliness in our community, uh, just individuals at home, as well as the people that we serve. And, you know, by any means, are we excluding for any other reason except safety? But as we come back, we hope to come back more educated streamlined and and ready to serve a different way because the people as you know because you've seen many of them and talked to many of them they've changed as well the impact of COVID has changed them the way they seek the services or the way they uh attempt to receive the kindness that people are offering them so we we have to change and, and get better we can come out on the other side of this better servants to our community so you know it it's 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 not a fast thing as emily stated and as i know adrian once again something i know you've heard me say you know we want to do this so we begin the meeting with it and we end the meeting with it and uh it, it, it's a thing but it's also a hard thing and you know some of it is 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 emotion but some of it is, you know most of it is really just common sense with a with a hint of professionalism has to be added in in a certain way to uh to get things done i really believe we will come out the other side of this better which will serve our people better now where that other side is i do not know but as we get closer to it one day i'll come up to somebody and say i think we're on the other side but i, I can't say that's going to be in may uh, but we do plan no, I, to, to bring the people back, everyone, community and volunteers as well. Okay, and, and you've made that clear, John, and I, you know, you, you're a good leader of the volunteers and we really respect everything you say. Uh, it's just, I, I guess <laughs> there are some of us, four of us that are just chomping on the bit to get back there. We've lost one, one you know, Kim is no longer with us. Uh, and I don't, I guess Pam can, I don't know about Pam for sure, but um, my question is, you know, last year, because I used to take intake for the last, I don't know, three years. At this time, we were having over 100 people, about 108 to 122 a day coming into the community first, a day. And then what you've told me that recently you're down to 20, 25, 23. So I just wonder if we opened it up and, and the entire homeless pop, you know, low income, not only homeless uh, population knew that City with Billings is now open for art, 
We're open for clay, for plants, for yoga, for all the other things we used to do before COVID if they wouldn't come back. And I guess I'm wondering, when is that safe to everybody, not just the volunteers, but to the guests, uh, to everybody? When can we get back to quote normal again? I, I guess I need that. That's my basic, basic. I don't know what to tell the volunteers. Um, um, yeah. Adrian, I think yes, yes. Um, Dr. Sanders point about a difference between policy and um, what decision making, your own personal decision making. I think our, our conversations are kind of switching from the safety and personal decision making to the policy making. And with Emily saying that this is the first step in introducing the volunteers back, um, maybe that conversation would be better off of this call, but it's totally heard because I understand that um, the, it, it seems safe for us to come back now and we know that it's getting safer. So with these plans are being thought about and we're excited to share them with you in our next steps of the volunteers training. And I know that the volunteer training is new, but it's also for the best because like with things like this, we're able to um, tell all of our different community members the new information that we've learned just now. I'm sorry, I still, I don't, we, to my knowledge, we have not been told when it would be safe to get back to normal. I don't believe either Alex or the doctor have told us that, have, unless I've missed something. I don't, I don't um, think that there, I don't think there is an answer to that, a definitive answer, which is the tension that we're all living in, is how do we take these best practices of, of keeping our volunteers and our, our community safe while still trying to maintain presence. And so, I mean, I think that's why we were listening to John and Alex tonight to kind of hear some of those things, but we will continue to be discerning as we have been for the last year. And so we are absolutely like, like Mimi said, and John said, and I said earlier, taking these steps to reopen safely and feeling that out and listening to governor's orders and listening to doctors. And if it, we're moving forward because we miss being in community. I mean, we're ready to dig back in and to see faces and to feel the fullness of life back in this space with all of, all of our folks, whether that's volunteers and with our community members. And if it reaches a point where it feels like it's getting to a place where we need to step back again, then we will be discerning and faithful in, do that, in doing that. And we'll pull back again. I mean, I think that's the reality of the world we're living in right now is this tension of how do you best maintain presence while also keeping a safe, you know, a safety net around stuff. And so we're grateful for, for Dr. Sanders and Alex who are our experts in the room and we're listening to those voices. And so the best we can do is be faithful in how we love each other and create that space and move forward. And when we have to, take steps back and then more steps forward. And it's just this delicate dance that we're all trying to, to figure out together. Um, so I, I mean, I'm grateful that we all were able to join this tonight and have this conversation and ask these questions and we'll continue to wrestle with it. And we'll try to do the best we can to make plans to reopen and do that safely. Like we said, we have we have conversations on the tables and, and parts and pieces of that in motion so we can do that sooner than later. And if it seems like it's not safe to do so, we'll, we'll readjust at that point. But the best we can do is just to be listening to the experts around us to open as we feel safe uh, to do so and to get our folks back together in community. John, do you have- That was- oh. oh, no, go ahead, Al. So I just wanna say that, that was very well said. Uh, Emily, I just want to add again, not from a policy standpoint, but from a safety standpoint that, you know, the first step was is, is getting the vaccine for volunteers, you know, that the volunteers are vaccinated. That's the first step to come back. The second step is, you know, like they all mentioned, you know, just having this conversation today. But I just want to also emphasize, um, you know, part of something that I like hope to hope to share from from this talk is that this is an extremely at risk 
population that we are working with at City with Dwellings. This is one of the most, if not the most at risk population in the country in terms of contracting COVID-19. COVID and so the things that we don't fully know, you know, we know that the vaccine prevents, uh, you know, severe infection, prevents hospitalization, prevents death. But we don't know yet fully, you know, if I'm vaccinated, is it really true that I that I can't get um, someone who's unvaccinated uh, ill with COVID-19. We, we think that's true. All the signs are pointing to that, but we don't have the full definitive data just yet to say, okay, masks off, like, like everyone said, I, I, we're all good to go. And so I think that's why, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't hurt to, I think, trend on the, on the side of, of caution as we're talking about this community specifically. It's, it's, it's very important that we, we keep um, the homeless population as safe uh, as we possibly can. And so I think that's just, again, from a safety standpoint, maybe that, that's something that's important to consider as, uh, you know, Emily and John and, and the good folks at City with Dwellings are coming up with the, the, the policies. Um, John Gladman, do you have anything else that you'd like to add before we go ahead and um, end our time together? Yeah, I mean, I know we're all a little fatigued of living in this time of uncertainty for something that we assumed was going to be three months <clears throat> but now we're moving into a year uh i know i miss everyone just as much as as many of you guys that are chopping at the bit but we have to be prudent in, in our decision making as as we move forward in bringing all of our community back now, you know, our numbers are, are down considerably. A lot, you know, there are a lot of different factors that go into that number that I expressed to you earlier, Adrian, of 20. You know, the city has broken up all the tent encampments. We had seven tent encampments less than a mile from the city with dwelling site. All those are gone. So this was a large part of our population. You know, Emily and Krista would go to these places I've been a few times, but now, I mean, they're not in walking distance anymore. So that impacts things. Uh, so how it's going to look on the other side, all we can do is put our best face forward as safely as possible and uh, continue to express kindness to those in our community and to each other. So as we move forward, it's almost a stay tuned style situation. Uh, and it will be week to week when we come back. So, it, you know, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's a commitment I can make. It will be week to week when we come back. I, I can't sit here and say, oh yeah, we're going to come back in full force and it's going to be the same forever and ever. I don't believe that's the world we're living in right now. But I want to thank everyone for logging on. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all. Everyone uh, on the call knows, knows my number, my email, call me. Um, I'm open and honest. So, uh, Stay tuned for the training videos and hope to see everybody soon. Alex, Dr. Just Sanders, say, thanks. I just want to say really fast two things. Always. I just want to say I put my email in the in the chat. So if anyone has any questions at all too, um, from a from a safety perspective and you know want more information too, I'm happy to to help point you to resources to answer those. So my my email, as I mentioned, is, is in the chat. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Sanders, for being here tonight. We really appreciate the time. We know that it's precious. And so much gratitude to you for joining us. And Alex, thank you for your presentation. And like we said, we'll, uh, we'll be sending out information about next steps because we are anxious to get you all back in here with us. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thanks thank for you. having me. Good seeing everybody. Bye, stop. Bye. Bye, Adrian. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you, Mimi. Hi, <laughs> Sherry. Hi there. <laughs> My cell phone's talking to me. <laughs> bye, y'all. I'm going to end the meeting. So make your waves.